We will now return you to our regularly scheduled programming. This is the worst! <laughs> See, welcome into the worst fantasy show. I am your host with the least, Jack Lusne. Uh, we are coming in with a pre recorded episode, so bonus, we will drop it early tonight. I'm saying we, like, there's more than just me here, but it's just me. Um, basically, uh, I just know that I'm going to be way too busy tomorrow. This is our last day on the freemium with StreamYard. Uh, I'm either going to figure out my deal with stream stream labs. Uh, and when I say deal, I just mean like figure out how to use it. Um, or I'm just going to pony up the dough for Streamyard because uh, I'm old and I struggle with changing technology. Uh, so either way, we'll be back live on Sunday for sure, for sure. Because A, I know I don't have anything going on this weekend. And B, we'll have everything set up again. Uh, so yes, yeah, Sunday morning, 9 a.m. We'll be there for all of your last minute start sick questions. Uh, so feel free to come jump on. Uh, but otherwise, I'm going to have this one go up uh, tonight, so it'll actually go up a day early. So at the very least, uh, you'll be able to get the information for all of the matchups, streaming, start sets, uh, and otherwise a day early. So let's just, without any further ado, get right into it. The matchups and start sets for this week seven of fantasy football. <laughs> So, uh, the Bears and Cowboys, the Chicago Bears and the Dallas Cowboys are on bye week. Uh, only two teams, but somehow still feels like a lot of fantasy assets are gone this week. When you talk about Dak Prescott, CeeDee Lamb, Frank Elicious, and Rico Dowdle, and then on the Bears side, you're talking about Keenan Allen, Roma Dooms, uh, DJ Moore, Cole Komet even coming off a really good game for tight end. Uh, Caleb Williams has been ascending uh, for quarterback. DeAndre Swift has had an excellent three weeks. So uh, a lot of fancy assets tied up in those two teams, even though just those two teams on bye week. Um, the one thing I will note, keep an eye out. Lots of teams suffering from injuries and dealing with uh, those bye weeks can be crucial. You may see in shallow leagues Keenan Allen or Rome Adunes drop and hit waivers if you have uh, the record to match. So, you know, you're four and two or better. And you also have an asset on your bench that maybe is of a lower quality, especially of a Roma Dunes who might be an ascending figure towards the end of the season. Um, that's I would be targeting maybe uh, especially again if Roma Dunes were to hit waivers possibly Keenan Allen you might see that happen there are teams that might have to make those decisions I'm not saying it's going to happen but again just keep your eyes open for who those other uh, teams are having to drop you know for waiver ads streaming ads and those kinds of things but uh, let's get into the matchups. For once, we're not just going to be right before the game. We're going to be a whole day early on the Broncos at Saints. Gross matchup, 37 point over under. Uh, we've got two rookie quarterbacks presumably playing in this game with Bo Nix and the Rattler Snake, Spencer Rattler, who did look a lot better than I thought he would. Uh, quite honestly, I actually thought he looked pretty decent. However, the Broncos defense has been just so good this season. I think uh, if I was going to play one of the defenses here, I actually think I would play the Broncos because Bo Nix has had games where he shows up um, and he's been okay for fantasy. Even last week, uh, he was decent for fantasy. So I think that of the quarterbacks here that can maybe surprise against the other defense, I actually think it would be the Broncos um, who maybe get out of here with a win against the Saints. Alvin Kamara should play. He's dealing with a hand injury. So unfortunately that's going to deviate any possible streamers of like Kendra Miller, or if you really want to deep dive on Jamal Williams, um, he's been practicing in a limited fashion is Kamara. So I do think he is going to play. So I think you obviously have to play Alvin Kamara in spite of the, 
you know, whatever the defense is, it's always because of those dump offs and his ability in the receiving game uh, and to get the touchdowns. So if Kamara plays, you play him uh, unless you just are completely stacked at running back. Like if you're like, Hey Jack, I'm in a 10 teamer and you know, I've got Derek Henry, Saquon Barkley and Alvin Kamara is my third running back. And I could play, you know, um, some pretty good wide receivers or, I have another, I have David Montgomery as my fourth running back. Like, okay, fine. There are worlds where you could bench Kamara. You better have a really good option to do it though. Uh, I think Chris Olave uh, is likely to miss this game. Um, I don't think he's going to make it in time. Uh, As far as it was a concussion, right? So he's not going to make it for the Thursday game. My guy, Bub Means showed up uh, last week. I think if you're in a really, really deep league, Bub Means is a potential play. But again, I think this Broncos defense is a really bad matchup. And if the problem is if Olave is out and Rashid Shahid is out, then that means Bub Means is going to be the primary target in a sense uh, in the wide receiver room. And then who's he going to have to deal with is Pat Sertain. Uh, So I. I think this is not a week that I would be trying to go back to the well of Bub Beans. If he's out there in your dynasty leagues, he's definitely worth a stash. Um, Even in deep enough redraft leagues in 16 teamers or plus, he's worth a stash. But I would not try to play him. For me, this is very much Alvin Kamara. And I think uh, in a really, in a pinch, if, and this is assuming also that Taysom Hill misses another week. I would play Jawan Johnson. Uh, you could go with Foster Moreau too, but I think jo- Johnson is the more natural receiver. And Derek Carr is the one that has the connection with Moreau. So I would very much prioritize Jawan Johnson. He's coming off three for 48. Not huge, but again, tight end. You're looking for at least a basement of six to eight points. And if you just have nobody else, and again, we're talking about you must have you have to be in like a 16 team league. Your guy is you have Cole Komet on a buy, um, you know, or you have Fergie Licious on a buy, that kind of thing. Um, on the Broncos side, <laughs> I'm frankly not trying to start anyone. In again, if in deep enough leagues, you're kind of forced to start Cortland Sutton. He just gets enough targets and maybe sometimes finds the end zone. Um, I think you can still throw in Javante Williams and just expect and hope for gross low volume, but there is not a reliable fantasy starter on this team in super flex. Even if Bo Nix is your third quarterback, unless your other quarterback is Kayla Williams or Dak Prescott facing the bye week, there's lots of other players I would play above Bo Nix. So for the Broncos, it's very limited in the options. And for the Saints, it's the same thing. Typically, I would just be trying to avoid this game altogether, especially because it's on a Thursday. And yeah, I'm. there are going to be points scored in this game. There's going to be fantasy points scored in this game. Predicting where and how that is going to go, um, I'll leave that for the sickos out there. Uh, let's get into the Sunday games. These are a little bit more fun. We'll start in London. The New England Patriots traveling to London. The Jacksonville Jaguars, who just got shellacked in London, are still there licking their wounds. I would presume this presents as a better matchup for the Jaguars. First of all, you're supposed to be the unofficial home team of the London crowd. But also now you've been there for a week and you have the other team traveling in across the pond. So I would think with a rookie quarterback like Drake May, and this is not Bill Belichick's staff anymore, um, you know, as much as I like Gerard Mayo, I just don't think they have kind of the same grip anymore on the preparation for for this organization. So I, I think the matchup is good enough that, just to give you an example, I would start Drake May over either Bo Nix or Spencer Rattler just purely based on the matchup with the Jaguars. But I actually think the Jaguars defense could be a sneaky start here because Drake may, even if he does perform well, I think is also going to make mistakes. 
and I could definitely see the Jaguars winning this game. And I could see it being on the back of a defensive touchdown or two. This feels wonky to me. For the Patriots, though, I, I again, I think you play Drake May. Pop Douglas in a pinch uh, if you really need him. Demario Douglas. Um, I'm, I think Jalen Polk, I need to see it more before I... It, it, I start just throwing him in my lineup again. I would have to be in really deep, like 16 team plus leagues. Um, and then Hunter Henry, that's the play that I actually think is really solid for tight end. Uh, he's someone that was widely dropped in a lot of leagues. So if you need a tight end, especially a streamer this week, I think Hunter Henry is a very viable play. Uh, and then obviously if Ramondre Stevenson plays, I'm willing to play him. I don't think I'm willing to play Antonio Gibson unless I'm absolutely desperate. Um, like, again, if I just have nobody and I have to play Antonio Gibson as my RB2 just to get some points, and this is assuming that Ramondre misses again, that's pretty much the only viable uh, option to me of playing him. And talking about the Jaguars side, I think this week you're going to be able to play Tank Bigsby. I think he's going to be the starter. So Travis Etienne is already tagged as doubtful. He's obviously been dealing with injuries. I think it's been overblown a little bit um, how bad he's been. I think he has been dealing with legitimate injuries and trying to play through them, and that's why they've been using this three-headed monster of Tank Bigsby and Dearness Johnson. And people have said, oh, well, you know, Tank looks better right now. I do think it is legitimately because of injury. And that's something that, just as a separate aside and rant, for my fantasy leagues that I commission next year, I am changing the injury settings. I am going to have the loosest injury settings that have ever been seen in the world of fantasy. If your guy is just questionable, you will be able to put him on IR. And I'm going to have a lot of IR spots too. Is It's not just that I'm going to have, I'm going to have, I think, minimum five IR spots and you'll be able to put anybody. Questionable, doubtful, I don't give a shit. Whatever kind of injury tag that exists will be allowed to go on the IR. And the reason I say that, and you're, I can hear you scoffing up there. I can literally hear it. Coming through the screen, the, oh, oh, but Jack, oh, the competitive and strategy, strategic nature of the game. Okay, no. Fuck that. These NFL teams are fucking around, all right? Uh, the way that these NFL teams have been using these injury designations, specifically this season, like, Travis Etienne is not doubtful. He is not fucking playing this week, and I'm sick of this shit of being held up of making a move because of a technicality because these NFL teams are clearly fucking around with these injury designations in some vain attempt to pretend that it gives them any kind of strategic advantage against that week's opponent. It is complete and utter horseshit, and I am sick of it. So next year, all my leagues, I'm up in the IR spots. There's going to be five to seven, depending on the depth uh, and nature of the league. Uh, and when I say that, I mean like it, five minimum. I think five is actually pretty solid, but I could see in a world uh, even where you have six or seven if you have really short benches. Like if you only have five man benches, I could see having six. Just because, again, this idea that like uh, even Cooper Cup now, Cooper Cup is tagged as questionable. There's a good chance he still doesn't play this week. Why the, should I be penalized? of having to hold Cooper Cup and just drop people for no reason. It's Again, this is not strategic nature. This is just complete horseshit um, and tomfoolery by these NFL teams and organizations and the way that they manage their injury designations, and I'm completely fucking over it. So, back to the game. Travis Etienne is not going to play. He's already tagged his doubtful. It means he's going to be out. You can start Tank Bigsby in, again, really 16 team plus. You can start Dearness Johnson even because they were using him clearly as the, you know, they're, they're going to use two running backs. And I'm fine. I'm, and I said this just yesterday on uh, shout out to my guy, John McGlynn. 
and uh, his boy JT. I was just on their podcast. Uh, I think it's called the Dynasty Evaluation Podcast. Um, but they do their work with Fantasy and Frames. Uh, if you are not familiar with Fantasy and Frames, I highly recommend that you check them out as well. That's a really solid, great group of uh, people and smart fantasy minds over there. Um, but I was on their show yesterday and I said, I'm fine with a running back by committee when it's two guys. And when those two guys especially have clear delineated roles, um, I think, you know, at the very high end, you look at a Jameer Gibbs and a David Montgomery. And I understand that can be very frustrating for a Jameer Gibbs owner, but I think if Gibbs had not been drafted so highly, like they're both succeeding. They're both having the ability to finish top 10 any given week and on the season, potentially both Jameer Gibbs and David Montgomery. So um, I look at also the bucks, you know, you look at Bucky Irving and the role that he has in that offense. I think regardless of whether it's Rashad white on one side or Sean Tucker on the other, you having a thunder and a lightning, a boom and a, a boom running back and a quick guy, has you know traditionally always kind of worked in the NFL even in the past and i think it's become even more viable in today's NFL because you don't want to just give one guy 400 carries every season and so having a a Derrick Henry and a Justice Hill they can both be viable on the same team um and when it's just two guys it works the problem is when a third guy gets involved and then you get the three-headed hound, the three-headed backfield, and that dogs your team, quite literally. Um, it, it just is the, – the Cerberus uh, is just a killer of NFL running back backfield. So if your running back by committee is three people, you're screwed. But if it's just two guys, I'm fine with that. That's so, again, kind of a long-winded way of saying that I would start Tank Bigsby, and then in deeper leagues I would start um, Dearness Johnson. And then I think it's pretty clear uh, as far as, like, you would start Christian Kirk and hope that it's his day. Evan Ingram as a tight end is a weekly start when he's healthy. Um, Brian Thomas Jr. had his first bad game, but I think he goes right back in the flames. You start him. Uh, and, yeah, and Trevor Lawrence, I think, this is a positive matchup. This Patriots defense doesn't scare me. Uh, so I think if I have Trevor Lawrence, I would play him again above auxiliary options. Um, kind of an interesting dilemma. Like, would you play Trevor Lawrence above Drake May? I think I personally would. I just think Drake May having, again, to fly over to London as a rookie, his first experience doing that kind of thing. Trevor Lawrence already having been there and settled in for the last – week and a half. I do think that is going to be an advantage, um, an intangible one. So we'll see if that really plays out, but that's kind of my level of like, I would play him above Drake May, certainly above, you know, Bo Nix and um, Spencer Rattler, maybe to my detriment, but I, I still think I view Trevor Lawrence as a average to above average play, like a guy that could finish 12 to 15 and maybe a little bit higher. Uh, moving along, getting into the actual Sunday matchups. We have Seahawks at Falcons, 51 and a half point over under. Seattle Seahawks, I think you just fire up everyone that you have. Uh, it has been rather disappointing for JSN. I don't think the true breakout is going to ever happen as long as Tyler Lockett is there. I think, unfortunately, Geno Smith just spreads the ball too much. JSN will have his days. If you have him and it's in deeper leagues, I would certainly play him. But I actually think in 10, for example, in a 10-man redraft, you can move on from JSN. He's he's actually droppable. Now, if you, if you know someone in the league that values JSN and you're able to trade him, always trade a player if you can help it. But if you send out offers, you're, you know, trying to work that magic and nothing is happening. Nothing is moving for you on JSN. And he's the one holding up your roster. Don't let what you invested and the name and the potential stop you from making a move 
that is more viable and helpful for your fantasy football team right now, especially if you're looking down the barrel of two and four, three and three, and you need to start winning some games to cement yourself in the playoffs. JSN is not helping you right now. If Tyler Lockett were to go down, if DK Metcalf were to go down, then certainly he would increase in value. But as long as all three of them are there, DK Metcalf has his own skill set and value and is a true alpha wide receiver. And then JSN and Lockett have kind of similar roles in this offense. And so you they're always going to be diluted in a sense. Um, this was always my fear. I didn't think that Tyler Lockett was just going to disappear this year. And he has a connection with Geno Smith, who just spreads the ball anyway. So, again, Lockett and JSN are still viable. Like, they still have good weeks. In full PPR leagues, they're good plays above really tertiary options. But they're wide receiver three flex plays, and you need to treat them as such. Uh, looking at the Falcons, um, I think this is another good matchup for Bijan. Uh, I think you start Drake London. I think Darnell Mooney kind of disappointed last week, but you go back to that well. Uh, you play Kirk Cousins and Kyle Pitts. It's kind of easy on the Falcons side. And uh, sorry, I didn't mention it on the Seahawks side, but Kenneth Walker obviously should be in your lineup. Uh, Geno Smith. He's going to be in above most options. I think there's maybe 10 quarterbacks you would play above him right now. Um, And if you have one of those guys or in a super flex, two of those guys, fine. But otherwise, Geno's going to be in your lineup, even though the Falcons, you know, average to above average defense. Uh, The one deep play, if you really need a tight end play, I think Noah Fant is also pulling targets away from the JSN and Tyler Lockett. duo so uh, he might be a really deep dive play but I prefer not to go to that well uh, so for me again this is you know Kenneth Walker DK Metcalf if you have JSN and Tyler Lockett and full PPR deep play fine Gino and then on the Falcon side like I said the usual suspects uh, getting into the Tennessee Titans at the Buffalo Bills we had a 41 and a half point over under here and <laughs> Again, I've said this a few times on a few shows now, but shout out to Andy Holloway shared all eight targets of Calvin Ridley's from Will Levis. Absolutely maybe the most brutal showing of targets I've ever seen on an NFL football field. They were either out of bounds um, or just completely uncatchable moon drop passes surrounded by three to four different players. Like it, the one catch that he did make and have, uh, he there were literally, um, he was bracketed and there was also another safety uh, coming into play. And uh, that safety, that second safety stripped the ball uh, and it was considered a drop, uh, drop pass. So, you know, I... <laughs> The wide receivers, Calvin Ridley and DeAndre Hopkins, I think they're worth stashing because eventually Mason Rudolph is going to have to step in. I I don't see how Will Levis just continues to torch this team the way that he has. Um, I think at some point Mason Rudolph will step in. It's not going to be this game necessarily, so I don't think you can play anyone on the Titans except for Tony Pollard, who is really their one viable fantasy asset. And then on the Buffalo Bills side, um, Obviously, excuse me, he missed the game, did uh, James Cook. So you have to keep an eye on if he's going to miss another game. And if he does, obviously, Ray Davis stepped right into being uh, a a great NFL running back play. So I think if James Cook plays, you can still play Ray Davis theoretically as a RB2 flex play, but you need to really temper your expectations. But if James Cook is out, it's – you know, all all guns up uh, on uh, on Ray Davis. Um, Amari Cooper, the big trade. Amari Cooper coming into the Buffalo Bills. Uh, no, I'm not playing him in this game because he is going to have to acclimate at least somewhat to the team and the environment and the playbook. Uh, so I I don't even know that he is going to play in this game. And even if he does, uh, it would, I would assume be on limited snaps. Um, So I'm just not going to mess with any Buffalo wide receivers 
at this moment in time. I'm very much just going to try and take a wait and see approach. Um, I think Khalil Shakir is still viable. I would hold on Khalil Shakir. I think Curtis Samuel is the one that's droppable now. Uh, and Keon Coleman also, you could potentially just stash and see if maybe he can ascend as a wide receiver too, where, you know, not all of the weight is on him. Uh, but I think honestly, Dalton Kincaid, you're forced to play him because of the tight end economy and how bad tight ends are. Uh, but it, this is very much Josh Allen and whichever running back plays and is healthy. So whether that's James Cook or whether that is Ray Davis. The Cleveland Browns, the poor Cleveland Browns, who just traded away Amari Cooper, will be at home taking on the Cincinnati Bengals. 42.5 point over under. Um, This is actually a bad matchup for the running backs for the Bengals. Um, On the Bengals' side, I would still play Chase Brown. I would not play Zach Moss. I think Chase Brown has more receiving upside and just more burst. Uh, If I'm picking a guy who's just going to have a long run uh, against this Browns defense who has been really good against the run, they even just shut down Saquon Barkley and gave him his first bad game of the year. Um, The Browns defense is pretty legit still, and especially their run defense is really good. So I would avoid the Bengals running backs. You can fire up absolutely T. Higgins and Jamar Chase here. Um, I, I'm not a believer really in Eric Hall as a tight end option. I think he's – the problem is they just share too much. Uh, all the tight ends do for the Bengals. They will use Mike Gesicki still, and they'll even use Drew Sample, the tight end three. They use all three tight ends, and if you're using all three tight ends, it means none of them are actually viable. Uh, Eric Hall is maybe a fine – dynasty stash but i don't even really believe in that to be honest um i think again i limit myself to jamar chase t higgins here uh obviously joe burrow on the brown side i'm i'm not doing it not this week i gotta see something from the this browns team deshaun watson has sucked the life force out of this fucking team and maybe just maybe nick chubb can give them some of it back uh supposedly from what i've been seeing early reports nick chubb may be making his return uh against this bengal's team if if nick chubb plays i'm playing him in the leagues that i have him and i don't have him in any redraft leagues um but i have him in some dynasty leagues where I, I look at between uh nick chubb and ty johnson i promise you i'm playing nick chubb you know between nick chubb and um, Isaiah Davis, who's the uh, running back three that nobody knows about on the New York Jets. You think Braylon Allen is hurting? Uh, you can't play it like he's unplayable. So above, obviously, you know those kind of options. Um, above other like starting options, n- no. But um, I, I don't, I don't think it would be crazy for Nick Chubb to come back and have a good game, his first game back, especially at home. And just kind of given what all the Browns are going through, if they just lean on the run and the defense and that emotional vibe of, again, the return of Nick Chubb, I think he could have a decent game here. He's the only one I'm even, I would even consider playing, honestly. Like you could say David and Joku uh, because of the departure of targets from Amari Cooper. And if he's continuing to get healthier, again, in this tight end economy, I would play David and Joku above like some pretty ridiculous options, and especially because if you're dealing with injuries or bye weeks, like above Noah Fan, above Greg Dulcich, above even Dalton Schultz um, in the next matchup. Sure, um, but I I would still also temper my expectation. I don't think David and Joku is just going to have like uh, 15 targets because Amari Cooper left. Um, and even if he does, the targets from Sean Watson, part of the problem has been they've been uncatchable. Like Amari Cooper was top 10 in targets, but only maybe 50% of them were even viable. So I yeah, like I said, if Nick Chubb plays, sure you can play Nick Chubb. Um, 
honestly, again, it, you have to be in really deep leagues or in a really bad state to be really trying to mess around with, you know, Jerry Judy and Pierre Strong and Deonta Foreman and kind of the other tertiary players of the Browns. Jerry Judy, maybe, I mean, if Jameis Winston at some point takes over this team, but from what I've seen from Deshaun Watson, again, it's like, okay, fine. If he gets 15 targets, seven of them are catchable and he catches four of them, it's like, okay, cool. He's going to get four for 50. That's basically what Amari Cooper was struggling with anyways. So um, I'm in a bit of wait and see mode here, but I would like to see Nick Chubb back at least just on an emotional standpoint. But let's get into maybe the best matchup uh, of the week. It kind of sucks that we're dealing with injuries again. Uh, but otherwise, this would be a high-flying matchup. Uh, the Houston Texans at the Green Bay Packers, 47.5 point over under. Um, obviously, Nico Collins is on IR. So you start Stephon Diggs, you start Tang Dell. We saw Joe Mixon come back. You start Joe Mixon, and you start C.J. Stroud, and uh, Dalton Schultz is just an absolute desperation play. But um, I really think this is a very clear and delineated offense. Stroud, Diggs, Dell, Mixon. Boom. Done. Packers. This is where it gets confusing. Obviously, Jordan Love is in. Jordan Love is the sum of all parts. Jordan Love is a fantastic quarterback. Jordan Love is a potential top five quarterback when he's healthy. So Jordan Love is in. Tucker Craft, I think you still keep going to that well. Um, of the two tight ends between him and Luke Musgrave, he is just the better receiving option. Again, I've pounded this narrative to death because it is true. Their draft profiles lined up similar to Mark Andrews and Hayden Hurst once upon a time when they were drafted by the Ravens. Tucker Craft fits the Mark Andrews profile. Musgrave fits the Hayden Hurst profile. So we're kind of seeing that a little bit already. I would keep going back to the Tucker Craft well if I have him. Again, you may have picked him up. So am I playing him above McBride? No. Even above Kincaid? No. Above Brock Bowers? No. Above Tyler Conklin? Yeah. Okay. Now you got me. Um, above uh, Colby Parkinson? Probably. Yeah, I think there's more upside there. So, again, secondary options. Even above, above um, Pat Fryermuth, I can tell you, unfortunately, Arthur Smith will just not allow the Muth to be good. So, I would play Kraft above the Muth. Um, the injuries is, come in with the wide receivers. Jaden Reed popped up with an ankle injury. He did play through it. If he plays, I would still play him. Dontavian Wicks is going to be out. Um, so I think you can take your dart throw on Christian Watson or Jaden Reed or Romeo Dobbs. If Reed is questionable, he's actually the one that I would have ranked third because I, I do think that if you're not at 100%, the way that the Packers run, it's it doesn't run through any one wide receiver. They're all kind of equally good, and it'll just go through whoever is having the game that day. It could be Dobbs. It could be Watson. It could be the tight end. It could just as well be the running backs. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think you start with confidence – not even with confidence. There's not, I was going to say with confidence, you can start, I guess, Christian Watson because he seems healthy right now. But I wouldn't even say with confidence. You can start him. You can start Dobbs. And if Reed plays and you just need him that bad, I would still play him. Um, again, it would have, I would have to have a decent enough option to go above him. Like if I had Josh Downs, that's one where I would be like, okay, I think I could play Downs above Reed if Reed is dealing with an injury. Um, but if you're talking to me about, Oh, um, Darius Slayton that I would still go with Jaden Reed and his upside in situations like that. Um, so I think that's pretty much it for the Packers. We can move on here. Miami Dolphins at the Indianapolis Colts, 44 point over under here. Jonathan Taylor seems to be trending again. This is where I don't understand what's going on 
with these uh, craptacular injury designations from the NFL. Now he's questionable, and there's a very good chance that he doesn't play this week. Um, as far as I know, the injury that he has is a three to four week injury. In theory, he could play this week. I just don't think he will. So I would be prepared not to play him. And I've seen Trey Sermon dropped. If you need a running back really badly, I would still play Trey Sermon, assuming Jonathan Taylor does not play. Obviously, if Taylor plays, you play him. But if Taylor's out like I think he's going to be, I think you can still play Trey Sermon. It sucked last week, but it's that's his game. It's 18 carries for 44 yards, and he didn't fall in the end zone, so it was a bad game. But if he falls in the end zone, it's a good game. I think he could fall in the end zone this game. Uh, so I think, again, you go back to the Trey Sermon well. If Anthony Richardson plays, I think you just, you eat it. You play him, assuming, again, it's a super flex. If it's a single quarterback and you have found better options at this point, um, like I, I honestly would play Aaron Rodgers above Anthony Richardson, I think, this week, even though it's a matchup against the Steelers' defense, just as a, an example. Like, I'm looking at Sam Darnold against the Lions, um, who is someone – I'm looking at Daniel Jones against the Eagles, even, uh, AOC against the Rams. I think um, I think they're going to be close enough that you may not need to take the risk on Anthony Richardson. And the problem with Anthony Richardson is if he plays, then I feel a lot worse about all of the wide receivers. I think Downs is still viable, but I don't particularly like playing any of the receivers. I do think if Joe Flacco plays, then you play Flacco, you play Downs, you play Pittman, um, and you play whichever running back is there, whether it's Taylor or Trey Sermon. On the Dolphins side, if you're really desperate in a super flex, I do think you can throw Ty Huntley um, in that super flex spot. Hopefully he'll get some running work and a, a touchdown or two here. I think the Colts defense can be had. Hopefully coming off a of bye week, they've had time to work with him, maybe scheme some things up with Tyreek Hill. Um, I do think I would play Tyreek because you are just kind of forced to, and he still is – Seemingly getting like, you know, five for 50. I I think until I see Tua come back, I'm fading the other receiving options. And as far as the running back, it's just whichever running back is there healthy and starting, you can still play them. So whether that is the Nation, whether that is Raheem Mostert, or whether that is even Jalen Wright, I think whichever, again, running back is there healthy and starting, you play. The problem becomes if all three of them are healthy and starting, which one do you play? I only would play a Shane in that case. I think I do think there's just as much chance that maybe most of it falls in the end zone a couple times, but I think Wright is the one Jalen Wright is the one that I fade. If all three of them are healthy and active and it goes back to being kind of a split between a Shane and most it, but with a Shane being the more explosive of them and, generally viewed as the starter i think a shane is the one that i would still be going with but this team desperately needs to to come back because they are absolute dog shit to watch without him the minnesota vikings in a divisional matchup with the detroit lions the vikings are at home it's a 49 and a half point over under uh sam darnold has looked uh, like a second coming of um, like a John Elway-esque figure. You know, he's uh, had a renaissance season so far. He is coming off his worst game, but I think the Detroit Lions, even though they have a good defense, they are better against the run than against the pass, and they are better at home than they are on the road. So I think you start Sam Darnold here. Obviously, Justin Jefferson is in your lineup. I think you can start um, Jordan Addison here. I'm not sure on uh, Hawkinson's status. If he is back and he plays this game, you can play him. Um, but I would I would prefer to wait and see at least a game or two of him being fully back. Um, uh, if I had a good – again, if if Hawkinson is kind of your tight end too and you've been riding a George Kittle, 
um, and Evan Ingram or that kind of type of Brock Bowers even. Uh, I would wait and see, but if, if you have to put him in your lineup, I don't hate that above a Dalton Schultz, for example. Um, for running back, I think Ty Chandler is going to be a sneaky stash and play. He hasn't been great this season, but he has been playing very much a secondary role behind Aaron Jones. And this is assuming Aaron Jones is not available. Obviously, if Aaron Jones is available, you play him. Uh, but if Aaron Jones misses, I do think Ty Chandler is worth an RB2 flex play. On the Lions side, this is easy. It's Goff, it's Laporta. Even though Laporta has not been as good because of the emergence of Jamison Williams, who I also think you play at this point because he is having, he's still a very boomer bust player in my eyes, but he just booms now more often than he busts. So I think you can play him. Obviously, Amon Ra is in your lineup, and then Gibbs and Montgomery are just locked in every week. Um, you're just having to temper your expectations, I guess, a little bit on uh, Jameer Gibbs because David Montgomery has been even better than expected. Uh, but you're pretty much firing up all of your Lions here, even though it is a tough, tough matchup against the Vikings defense on the road. The Philadelphia Eagles at the New York Giants, the last of the one o'clock games, 43 point over under here. You start all your Eagles. Um, even though Saquon is coming off his worst game of the season, you got to you gotta know he's got a little bit of revenge game coming in for the New York Giants. So Saquon Barkley, very obviously in your lineup. A.J. Brown, Devonta Smith, obviously in your lineup. To Dallas Goddard uh, suffered an injury. The the backup is uh, Grant Cal 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 uh, Calculations, uh, Grant Calcaterra. Uh, he's maybe worth a flyer in really deep dynasty leagues, maybe as a stash, uh, or, you know, uh, again, the, if you're in one of these crazy, like 32 team leagues, go ahead and maybe find uh, grant Calcaterra on your waiver wire. Uh, but otherwise I'm obviously just sticking with Hertz, AJB, Devonta Smith, Saquon, boom, moving on down the line for the New York giants. We would hope for the return of Malik neighbors. But are we really hoping for the return of Devin Singletary? Because I know Singletary's been good, but Tyrone Tracy, my guy, he's been better. Um, so I actually think uh, I would be fine if they slow roll the return of Devin Singletary and give Tyrone Tracy another week. I would play him even against the Eagles. If Singletary is back, uh, I think I'll... If Singletary is back, I would play Singletary and I would not play Tyrone Tracy um, unless I just, again, had no other options. I do think if Singletary is back, he's going to get 80% of the snaps. They, I don't think they're going to rush him back because of how good Tyrone Tracy's been. So I would assume that if Singletary is back, it's going to be because he's ready to play. And I would assume that he sees 70 to 80% of the snaps. And that's going to really put a cramp in the style of Tyrone Tracy. Um, so... Hopefully, Tracy can maybe just emerge as the starter by the end of the year. I'm still going to hold on to him even when Singletary comes back for a couple weeks to see if maybe, um, you know, if that 20% can grow to 30 and then 40 and then maybe it flips to where, you know, Tyrone is the one that has the 60 and Singletary has the 40 even when they're healthy. And then maybe it just turns into Tyrone Tracy's our starting running back. Um, I do think he's really good. and that's a viable possibility because again, Devin Singletary is more of a journeyman on his 13 now uh, on a, I'm pretty sure a one year contract as far as I know. Um, so it wouldn't shock me for them to invest more in Tyrone Tracy, who they drafted. Um, and then for the receivers, again, I think if neighbors is out, uh, I, I like Wandale and PPR. I guess you can go to Darius Slate and I get, I don't I think he will turn into a pumpkin more often than not. Again, he's traditionally a guy that's going to get you 7 to 800 yards and 5 to 6 touchdowns a season. The problem is predicting when those come. Um again, 16 plus team and you don't have anybody else and you're just really hurting. I don't mind throwing him in, but he is very much a not even a wide receiver 3 flex. I view him as like a wide receiver 4 flex. Like there's lots of wide receivers I think are viable starts above Darius Slayton. So even if Malik Neighbors does miss, I think Neighbors should be back by now, though, for this game. So I'm projecting that 
It'll be Neighbors and Wandale. Whichever running back is available, whether that's Singletary or Tracy. And then again, Daniel Jones, if you're just really hurting or injured or, you know, have a quarterback on a bye week and just need a, a one-time streamer. And uh, I, I can understand that. Um, let's get into the four o'clock games here. The Las Vegas Raiders at the Los Angeles Rams, 43 and a half point over under here. Potentially the return of one Cooper Cup. Um, again, now he's tagged as questionable. I don't even know if he's actually going to be back this week. If he is, I'm going to play him uh, above a lot. Of, I'm going to play him like a wide receiver too, essentially. Um, and if he's not back, then I will still go to the 2-2 Atwell, Demarcus Robinson well. And if Cup is back, only 2-2 Atwell, because I think he's just the more explosive and uh, has more potential as a wide receiver 2-3 behind Cup. Colby Parkinson, if you just need 6-8 to eight points for tight end, is a desperate play. Uh, I would still play Matt Stafford. Uh, again, Matt Stafford to me is like a, a quarterback 15 to 18. So if you have better options, you play them, but you might not. So I would still play him above really, again, tertiary options, um, bottom of the barrel kind of guys. Uh, speaking of on the Raiders side, uh, Aiden O'Connell. I actually don't think this is a bad spot for an Aiden O'Connell stream. If you just have nobody else and you need a quarterback stream for a super flex, I do think Aiden O'Connell is going to do okay here. He did okay against the Steelers defense, which is a lot better than the Rams defense who are very beat up. Uh, so I think you can start Aiden O'Connell in a pinch in a super flex, but that's it. I'm not fucking around with any of these other players right now, except Brock Bowers. Uh, I think Obviously, Brock Bowers is an elite tight end, and now he should see even more targets. But other than Brock Bowers, like Jacoby Myers is still dealing with an injury. Until I see him come back, I'm I'm not playing him. Um, and Trey Tucker hasn't really emerged, unfortunately, like I thought he may have the opportunity to. He's just so inconsistent. You can't rely on any of these guys. And, you know, Alexander Madison as a running back is just hilarious in this year of 2024 uh, with the failure of Zamir White. I wouldn't really fuck around with either of them unless I just was absolutely desperate for an RB2. Um, for me, this is Brock Bauer's end of list. And then on the Rams side, honestly, like, I mean, Kyron Williams is so obvious that he's just in your lineup every week and like lock, stock, two smoke and barrels. Uh, but again, I would play Stafford in a deep pinch Parkinson. If Cup does come back, I'll play him as a wide receiver too. And I like Tutu Atwell as a as like a deep flex play. The Carolina Panthers at the Washington Commanders. 51 and a half point over under. We got some juice on this game. I actually think I would play Andy Dalton. I would go back to that well. Um, again, if I'm looking uh, down the barrel at options, um, like a no Connell, like we were just talking about, uh, the Dolphins quarterback, Ty Huntley, um, you know, Deshaun, obviously Deshaun Watson, <laughs> that feels mean to say Will Levis type characters, um, you know, even potentially Drake may on the road in London, Bo Nix and Spencer Rattler on a Thursday night matchup. Like I'll play Andy Dalton over almost all of the guys that I just said. Um, and then I think you play Deontay Johnson, you play Chuba Hubbard. You can take a deep dart flow, uh, dart throw on Xavier Leggett, uh, but that's pretty much it. I wouldn't mess around too much with the Panthers side. I think where we are finding value is on the commander side. Um, obviously, if Brian Robinson returns and plays, you play him. If he is out, you still can take the deep flex shot on Austin Eckler and even uh, Jeremy McNichols. It might not work. Uh, but I will say the Panthers, I think, might be the number one fantasy defense to target for running backs right now. Um, and if the commanders get up early, I could definitely see them leaning on the running backs. So I could, I would still go back to the well of uh, if I need the flex or if I just need an RB2 and a body. I'll throw in um, Austin Eckler and I'll throw in Jeremy McNichols. Um, Terry McLaurin. Great matchup here. Had two touchdowns last week. You just keep going back to that well. I think Noah Brown is a deep flex play here for the Commanders. 
Uh, he had eight targets last week and like four for 58. So I think he might be worth a, a play here if you really need a wide receiver three. Um, and uh, obviously Jaden Daniels is going to be in your lineup. And Zach Hurts also, if you're just desperate for a tight end stream, this is a good matchup. And he's been quietly reliable for like, again, six to eight fantasy points. The Kansas City Chiefs at the San Francisco 49ers. This is a big matchup. I think um, the Niners, especially with, uh, what's his face? Jordan Mason now dealing with an AC joint sprain, potentially going to miss this game. I've quietly been picking up Isaac Garendo, who had 99 rushing yards last week, in a lot of spots where he kind of made it through waivers uh, and hasn't really been, you know, he's been overlooked a little bit, I feel like, as the next man up potentially for the 49ers, especially if Jordan Mason misses. Even one in two weeks, I will absolutely take a shot at Garendo here. Um, so if Jordan Mason is out, even though the Chiefs are a really good run defense, I'm absolutely playing Isaac Garendo. Uh, he just has a lot of bursts. He's the guy that ran the 4-3, um, but it's like a big boy running back. And it was very surprising that he ran that fast at the 40 uh, at the combine. So it has a great physical skill set and the best possible landing spot. Uh, so if, if again, if Jordan Mason is out, I'm playing Isaac Garendo. Um, in spots again where I'm like, I'm hurting and I need the RB too. I'm not playing him above like Tony Pollard, even uh, just to give you an idea or Joe Mixon or anything like that. Uh, but I'm playing him above. Uh, we just talked about Austin Eckler and Jeremy McNichols as possible flex plays. I would hundred percent play Garendo above them and hope for the best. Um, I think where it gets mucky is the wide receivers. Brandon Ayuk has just not shown up this year, except for once, but you have to keep playing him. Debo Samuel had one of his best games of the week last week. He could just as well disappear. You have to keep playing him. These are two guys that I would honestly, I think Debo, especially I would be trying to actively trade right now. Brandon Ayuk, his value is uh, too low to get a good return on value. So I don't think you trade Ayuk right now, but I would actively be shopping Debo Samuel as much as possible. I think you play um, with confidence, Purdy and Kittle. You play Debo and Ayuk and hope it's their week. And you play the running back, uh, whether that is Jordan Mason, who I don't think is going to play as far as I know. Uh, it, I do think it'll be Isaac Garendo that you can throw in the flex or as an RB2. Uh, the Chiefs side. And Kareem Hunt was looking okay. But Clyde Edwards-Alaire is now officially off of the NFI list. He is going to be back. This is very much turning into a gross three-headed backfield of Samaj P. Ryan, Kareem Hunt, and CEH. I would play Kareem Hunt only above the grossest of gross options or like just to have a body fill in at my RB2 spot because I need to see it this week if CEH comes in and fucks things up for this backfield. As far as the wide receivers, you can play Juju. Uh, he basically just came back to the team and right back into his old role, uh, which is Rashi Rice's role as like the more possession type wide receiver. And Xavier Worthy is worth a play every week just as a boomer bust candidate. Very much, you know, could get the long touchdown or can even get rushing touchdowns. So it's kind of touchdown or bust with him, but He's used in different ways. He's used as a gadget player, and he has uh, a lot of upside. So I would be playing him, especially in any kind of lineups where if I have a lot of floor plays or if I'm playing a number one seed and I really need a boom week to kind of get past that, I would play worthy over some auxiliary options. Um, and then I think Mahomes, you just, again, I, I'm treating Mahomes as like a QB 10 right now where – if I have a really amazing option ahead of them, which I probably don't, I'll play them. But uh, most often I'm having to play Mahomes still in a lot of leagues. Uh, and then Travis Kelsey also in this economy at tight end. Uh, obviously you're playing him. All right. Sunday night matchup. We got the New York Jets at the Pittsburgh Steelers. And now the Steelers are suddenly talking about we're going to start Russell Wilson. 
why? Why? Oh, my God. The press conference was maddening. It's not about what Justin Fields has or has not done. Bro, I love you, Tomlin, but shut the whole fuck up. Uh, this is the dumbest, possibly the dumbest move I've seen in this entire NFL season. And maybe, I think this might be potentially the worst decision in the history of the Steelers organization of my lifetime. I know maybe in the past, I know there's some old timers that are going to be screaming out there of, oh, back in 1976, look, in my lifetime, in my lifetime. Except for passing on Lamar Jackson in the 2018 NFL draft, this this might be the dumbest fucking decision in the history of the Pittsburgh Steelers organization. We are 4-2. and two. We're coming off our first 30-point outing of the season. Justin Fields just had... 50 rushing yards and two touchdowns. And I understand it was with his legs. I don't give a shit. All right. All we've got is George Pickens and fucking nobody else. Like Arthur Smith is out here scheming our fucking fullback, uh, Cameron Hayward's brother, uh, for fucking more yards and touchdowns than Pat Farmia. So the fact that Fields is getting 30 points on the board with his legs fucking great and now you want to go to maybe one of the most unlikable personalities in the history of the nfl someone who has been rejected now by multiple teams uh like oh this is just infuriating honestly this could lose this could be the decision that if this goes bad if this goes wrong and somehow like Russell Wilson costs us games and then we try to go back to fields and it takes a couple weeks and da, 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 and we somehow miss the playoffs. Look, this, the Steelers are not a reactionary organization. I know people have wanted them to fire Tomlin for years. I still don't think it would happen even if what I'm saying happens, but it would at least be considered because it would be such an epic fucking failure and such a, such a mismanagement of player asset and organization. Just fucking trade Russell Wilson. If you promised him he could be a starter, trade him to one of these fucking ass teams that don't have a starter right now. Trade him to the fucking Dolphins. Trade him to the fucking... Um, trade him to one of these teams to make them watchable, for Christ's sake. Trade him to the Saints. Uh, trade him to the Titans. Oh, my fuck. Yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense. Trade him to the Titans. Give us Calvin... Straight up. Calvin Ridley... Uh, and a fourth for Russell Wilson and a third and a fifth. Boom. Done. Like, oh man, this is, huh, huh. Okay. For fantasy, <laughs> for fantasy, um, look, if Russell Wilson is taken over, I mean, I don't really want to play anyone. I think George Pickens, Najee Harris, and know that Najee Harris has a terrible matchup. Um, and I'm not playing Russ. Uh, again, it's the, the Jets defense is really good too. That's the problem on the Jets side. I mean, Steelers defense is really good too. So, I mean, you have to start Brees Hall, uh, Garrett Wilson. You're still going to start this game. Cause I don't think Devonte Adams is going to be ready quite yet. Not for this game. If he is, it, I would assume again, it would be unlimited snaps and based purely on his chemistry and correlation with Hackett and Rogers. Um, I wouldn't play him if he plays necessarily. I don't think so. Anyways, it would be crazy for him to just come in and have 10 targets on his first game. Uh, and like less than a week after being traded, uh, I still think it maybe takes two weeks. I don't think it takes long, but I do think it takes two weeks. And I don't think against the Steelers defense is the time to do it. I think Garrett Wilson is viable here. So I think Garrett Wilson, Brees Hall, uh, Aaron Rodgers in a pinch, like in, in a deep pinch. I still have him right for this week. I would have him ranked as like a quarterback 20, basically. So again, there's only 10 to 12 guys that I'll be playing uh, that I would play Rogers above them. But this is just, this is a shitty matchup. It's a 38 point over under. I don't know if I said that, but it's just, I would, again, certain matchups and teams, I'm just actively trying to avoid if possible. And this is one of them. Monday night, we're back to the stupid double headers. Uh, the Baltimore Ravens at the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, 48 and a half point over under. Might be the best game of the week. 
Um, and it's funny because this is the one that would be on first. So it's going to cut into the other one. So I would assume that people aren't going to want to watch Chargers at Cardinals over uh, Ravens Bucks. Uh, but this is obviously you start all your players here. Mark Andrews, son of a bitch. He did it. Exactly. Like I said, the fantasy gods are fickle. So the week prior, everyone was saying, oh, this is the Mark Andrews game. This is the Mark Andrews game. And I said, ah, -ah that's not how it works, guys. It's good. And then what happened? He had another dud. And then this week pass, I said, this is the Mark Andrews week. Because now everyone that was saying it, they're now off of it. And this will be the Mark Andrews week. And he had his best week of the season because he caught a touchdown. So can you go back to that well? Yes, I think you can. If you have Mark Andrews, you just throw him back out there. Hope and pray. He's he's healthy. He's playing. Tight ends are shit this year. You just hope that it goes to him again and not Isaiah Likely. Um, and you could, if you're a likely believer, you could throw Likely in because he is just as likely to catch the touchdown. So um, the only one I'm really confident here, Lamar, Derrick Henry, week in, week out. Those are your guys. And then I think uh, Zay Flowers has started to come along a little bit. In full PPR leagues, I prefer it. He hasn't getting a lot of touchdowns, but he is starting to get the targets and receptions um, needed to be a viable week-to-week -week play. I still view him as a wide receiver 2-3. Um, so, again, I, I would, if you're just stacked at wide receiver for some reason, I would. there's a couple rare guys that would play above him, but I – for the most part, you're playing him. Um, so on the that's easy. On the Bucks side, it's also pretty easy, actually. I think the only confusing situation right now is the running backs. And I said kind of earlier in the show, I'm fine with a running back by committee if it's two guys but not three. If Rashad White is healthy and they're going to play White and Irving and Tucker, I'm kind of out on all three for now. If White is out or for some reason gets traded or X, Y, Z happens. But as long as White is not playing, I'm really in on Tucker and Irving. I think they're both viable RB2 flex plays. I mean, obviously Godwin and Mike Evans are in your lineup. Baker is in your lineup. And then again, deep tight end pinch. If you need a flex, I'm doing it this week to cover for Cole Komet in the league. I'm playing Kate Otten. That feels like a guaranteed eight fantasy points if I've ever seen it. Last matchup here. The Los Angeles Chargers at the Arizona Cardinals. This sucks. Uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. dealing with a concussion. I don't think he's going to play even though it's on the Monday night. I think they're going to be safe and hold him out, which means it's going to be Kyler Murray with like Michael Wilson and the Dorch and uh, McBride. Um, I still think you play Kyler, McBride, James Conner. And in deeper leagues, I'm fine with Michael Wilson and even the Dorch, but I don't think the Dorch is really a thing. On the Chargers side, um, I would play Justin Herbert. I, again, I'm looking at Justin Herbert purely as a quarterback 15 to 18 range. I have him just ahead of Aaron Rodgers, for example. Like I would play him ahead of Rodgers because of the matchup. I think he's the sum of all parts. So whether the touchdown goes to Quentin Johnson or Ladd McConkie or whoever else, it, it doesn't matter. It helps Herbert, right? Um, and he hasn't been throwing as much, but he had his highest uh, pass attempts this last week. And in this road matchup against the Cardinals, I do think they will throw the ball a little bit because obviously they're missing Gus Bus. I like Kamani Vidal as a stash. I'm not playing him yet. Uh, for me, this is Justin Herbert. This is um, J.K. Dobbins. And again, in very deep leagues, like 16 team plus five, throw in Lad McConkey. And I'm the biggest Lad McConkey guy. I had him uh, in the bet with my guy Hooftube above JSN on who produces more fantasy points this year. And I'm still not that confident in it. I do think he can get better by season's end. He did lead the team in targets last week. So if there's a, a wide receiver, I'm still taking the dart throw on. It's him. I could see it being Quentin Johnson if you're still a QJ truther out there, but for me, it's Ladd. 
Uh, but really, I'm trying to get out of here with just playing Herbert and Dobbins and nobody else. Um, and then again, on the Cardinals side, it's Kyler, it's uh, Trey McBee, and it's James Conner, and preferably nobody else. All right, let's get into a couple streamers, and let's get on out of here. Don't tell me. We're about to go over a huge waterfall. Yep. Sharp rocks at the bottom? Most likely. Bring it on. For quarterback, um, in single quarterback leagues, I saw Kirk Cousins was actually dropped in one of my leagues. So Kirk Cousins is a viable streaming play. But I also like Andy Dalton. I think Andy Dalton um, is still available on a lot of waivers um, and has been dropped by some people who used him as a streamer previously. Uh, Kirk Cousins at home against Seattle. Andy Dalton on the road against uh, the Washington Commanders. Uh, and then in Superflex. If you're desperate and you need someone to fill in that quarterback spot, Ty Huntley, uh, quarterback for the Miami Dolphins uh, currently, um, he'll be facing the Indianapolis Colts on the road. They do tend to give up some fantasy points. He might be able to get two touchdowns in this game. That might be enough to be viable again uh, as a qu quarterback play in a very deep league. For running back, uh, as I mentioned, Ty Chandler versus Detroit. Uh, again, if Aaron Jones is out, I think Ty Chandler is a viable RB2 flex play. If Jonathan Taylor is still out, I think Trey Sermon, who I'm seeing dropped in many leagues, is also viable. Even though it sucked, it was 18 attempts last week. Um, so if Jonathan Taylor is out, I would expect the same kind of workload, and you hope he falls in the end zone. And if you just need a body, Emmanuel Wilson, this is the real deep, deep, deep play again this is i mean i'm assuming you're in a 16 team plus league and there is no real waivers uh emmanuel wilson might be floating out there if you just need a body you look at his carry count this season week one to now four five twelve eight six seven so he is getting carries every single game he is at least getting you a couple of fantasy points do not leave a zero in that spot um, if you just have nobody else, and again, very deep leagues, throw Emmanuel Wilson in there. It's a good matchup against Houston. Wide receivers, Tutu Atwell and Demarcus Robinson against the Las Vegas Raiders are good spot starts. Even if Cooper Cup comes back, I actually think they're even better spot starts, specifically Tutu Atwell if Cooper Cup comes back and eats up some attention. Uh, Rashad Bateman has been serviceable. He is worth a deep, deep play. Uh, if you're hurting, uh, it's a good matchup uh, Monday night against Tampa Bay. And the one I really like, I mentioned it earlier, Noah Brown. Saw eight targets against Baltimore, went four for 58, and has a home matchup against the Carolina Panthers for the Washington Commanders. So I like Noah Brown in this matchup if you need a deep wide receiver play. Tight end, Colby Parkinson versus the Vegas Raiders. This is only if Cooper Cup is out. If Cup is in, I am not that heavy on Parkinson. I would much rather go with Cade Otten, the Tampa Bay tight end against the Baltimore Ravens. And if you need a play still, Zach Ertz, the old man, the dust in his bones. Still getting it done, though. Uh, he should be good for five to eight points against the Carolina Panthers. Uh, giving defense. Speaking of defense, streaming defense, the Cincinnati Bengals will take on the very sad Cleveland Browns, even though Cleveland is at home, even though Nick Chubb is potentially returning, Deshaun Watson is still the quarterback, and so whatever defense is playing against the Browns is still viable until further notice. Um, the Jacksonville Jaguars, this one takes some stones. The Jags have been a hot mess on defense, but the talent is there. They actually have a pretty good defense on paper. The fact that they've been able to spend the extra week in London, you would hope, you would hope that they are able to game plan for a rookie quarterback coming in in Drake May. 
who, even though he could potentially have some good plays, I think is also viable to have some bad plays. So I think uh, the Jags defense could be a good streamer here. I also like the Rams against the Vegas Raiders. They have just given up Devontae Adams. It is Brock Bowers and not much else. Jacoby Myers is still questionable in dealing with an injury. The running back room is non-existent. I think um, AOC is uh, also viable to make uh, some mistakes here. So I think the Rams at home, even though their defense has been pretty beat up, definitely worth a stream here against an uh, even uh, worse, potentially Las Vegas Raiders offense. And kickers are people too. Chase McLaughlin. I'm going to keep saying the name Chase McLaughlin until you guys get his roster percentage to a reasonable and respectable amount. Uh, the kicker for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Um, he is going to be at home against Baltimore. Still only 56% rostered on sleeper. He is number six on the year guy. Um, he is uh, killing it right now uh, for the Buccaneers and their offense just looks very steady. So I think that's just a year long ad. If he's still out there and you have a kicker that's been struggling, trade up for Chase McLaughlin. Um, also, Actual streaming kickers this week, Matt Gay and Jason Sanders uh, for the Indianapolis Colts and Miami Dolphins, uh, respectfully. They will be facing each other in a matchup where both the defenses are just good enough to bend but not break. I do expect to see a little bit more field goal play in that matchup, so I think Matt Gay and Jason Sanders are both viable streamers. And finally, Austin Siebert, the Washington Commanders kicker has climbed all the way to number five on the year. He is a top five kicker, you guys. He has one missed kick on the season last week against Baltimore. It was a blocked, tipped kick. It wasn't even his fault. It was tipped at the line. He is otherwise 15 for 15 on extra points, 15 for 16 on field goals, including that hilarious seven for seven game against the New York Giants. If you need a kicker, if you need to trade up, if you have a guy that is struggling, go get you some Austin Siebert. And at the same time, go get you some like and subscribe for this show. Smash that button. Boom. And I will see you guys on Sunday morning again, 9 a.m. And until the next time, I'll catch you all on the flip side. He's running down the middle by the 50. He's at the 30. He's bare chested and banging his chest. Now he runs the opposite way. He runs at the 50. He runs at the 40. The guy is drunk, but there he goes. The 20. They're chasing him. They're not going to get him. Waving his arms, bare chested. Somebody stop Look that out. man. Here comes